Um, so it's 5.15 and I'll call the meeting to order. Um, welcome everyone to the monthly Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission meeting in San Mateo County. Um, let's do a roll call. Um, Commissioner Huber Levy, will you do the honors, please? Be happy to. So, um, com Chair Labuis. <laughs> I'm present. I'm present. Um, Commissioner Enriquez. She, no. I got a I got an email saying that she'll be a bit late, so I don't think she's okay. here yet. All right, Commissioner Bocanegra. And he's going to be uh, absent today. Okay. His wife's birthday. So, oh, so okay. Uh, Commissioner Flores. <laughs> Despite the fact that we do have a quorum, um, I did also get a notice that Commissioner Flores is on vacation, so not here today. Okay. Commissioner Kare Aurora. Present. I see you here. Uh, Commissioner Newton may not have joined us yet. I don't see her. Uh, Commissioner Nori. Here. Commissioner Rasmussen. Here. Commissioner Swope. Here. Commissioner Willis. Not yet. And Commissioner Wilson. Here. Okay, All that's right. it. Is that everybody? Okay. Do you, uh, do we have a quorum? Three, four, five, six, seven, I think. Yes. We do. Okay, great. And I see that Commissioner Newton has joined us. So that makes eight. Oh, great. And um, Commissioner Willis did tell me he was going to come. So could uh, could one of you, maybe Commissioner Wilson, maybe give a, send him a text? Will do. Thank you. All right, great. So we have a, uh, a quorum and let's get started in our meeting. The first thing we are continuing to meet remotely. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to adopt the resolution to meet remotely that AB 361. I move that do. we adopt resolution for AB 361 that we meet remotely. Terrific. I second that. Great. Any discussion about that? All right, let's 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 have a voice vote to adopt that. Uh, that resolution for anyone who wants to see it is uh, is in the agenda packet. Um, our commissioners come off mute and all in favor say aye. 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 Any uh, nays or abstentions? All right, sounds like that is a un unanimous vote uh, to continue to meet remotely. Next on our agenda is our uh, minutes from our last meeting, which is in May, at the end of May. Uh, those were also in the agenda packet. Did anyone have any changes to the minutes? I do. I Go reported ahead. the amount of fundraising incorrectly, and it should be $130,000 for year one for the PeerPoint project. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, sorry, Melissa, mm -hmm. I think we have 130,000 for year one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, year two, I'm sorry. Year two should say 40,000. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing the update about that later in our agenda. Oh, actually, sorry. Year two should say zero. It uh, should say 20,000. I'm sorry. So just to be clear, it's 130 in year one and 20,000 in year two. 20 in year two and 20 in year three. <laughs> okay, great. This is the source of the original confusion on my part. <laughs> Does anyone else have any uh, changes to the minutes from May? Uh, 
All right, then I'll move that we adopt the minutes from May. Is there a second? I'll second that. And assuming there's no more discussion on that, let's uh, let's also have a voice vote. Uh, so commissioners, make sure you're off mute. And all in favor of adopting our minutes from May, which will then be posted on our website, uh, say aye. 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 Great. Any any nays or any abstentions? The minutes are adopted. Uh, thank you. So um, now uh, let's also approve the agenda for this evening. Uh, that is at the top of the agenda packet and posted on the website as well uh, for anyone who, um, who wants to see it. Uh, so anyone I move have we any changes? The agenda. What's that? I move we accept the agenda. Great. Is there a second? Do we need a second, Susan? I think we need a second, right? I will I second. second that. Okay, great. Right. Karen, you beat me to it. Uh, okay. Vice Chair Huber Levy. Uh, any discussion about the agenda? Great. Then, uh, hearing none, uh, let's also approve that with a voice vote. Um, make sure you're still off of mute. Commissioners and all in favor say aye. 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 Any abstentions or uh, nays? All right, the, the agenda is adopted as well and we will uh, keep moving forward. One thing that I forgot to mention when we did uh, roll call and introduced all the commissioners uh, is that uh, the agenda shows that we will hear from some of our partners in the county um, in the uh, uh, soon early in the um, in the agenda so we'll get we'll hear their introductions then but uh, if you are a member of the public or, or anyone else uh, and you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat please feel free to do that uh, we'd love to hear from you okay moving on with um, with the agenda uh, there's a membership update. I don't know if, is Commissioner Enriquez on yet? Okay, I had the uh, the first first item on the membership update. I put that on the, uh, on the agenda. Uh, you can see that later in the agenda, we're going to swear in uh, Wesley, uh, Lou and Amea Nori as new commissioners, which uh, I'm very happy about. The, all of the approvals from the Board of Supervisors and the court came through. So when uh, Judge Adizadi gets out of court uh, and is able to join us, we'll, um, we'll switch over to that agenda item and get them sworn in. Uh, they will be effectively um, replacing, well, next month, I guess, they will replace uh, Commissioner Aurora and Commissioner Willis. And it looks like we got Commissioner Willis to join. I see Austin's iPhone down there on the Zoom. Welcome, Austin. Uh, as they will both be moving out of county to go to college. Uh, so, um, so they, I checked with them and they let me know that they would be uh, stepping down from the commission um, uh, uh, after this month. Uh, so, so I wanted to thank them for um, for their great service to the uh, to the county and the community, and uh, and and maybe we'll continue to see them volunteering remotely or uh, or participating in some way. But um, Austin and Armand both, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, and that is not to say that you're not voting tonight, if you need to. Um, you're still a commissioner, but um, after this, uh, at our next meeting, um, they will not be present as commissioners. So, round of applause. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, we also did receive uh, a new application um, 
And, uh, and so we will be reviewing that and getting in touch with those of you who have been on the committee to, uh, to review applications and to interview candidates. Uh, an application that uh, I'm excited about. So we'll more to come on that. Uh, and I don't think Commissioner Enriquez is here to, uh, to add any further yet. So, ah, I see she just joined. Commissioner Enriquez, welcome. Um, I was just updating everyone that, um, that uh, Armand and Austin we're going to be stepping down from the commission next month and uh, we do have new commissioners to swear in this month and that and i was also saying that we received a new application which we'll be reviewing yes do you correct. have anything else that you wanted to add on the membership update was there anything more from your side of things so that uh yeah we did receive um uh, a application, I think you already mentioned that. Um, and I'm still continuing to do some outreach and some of the um, uh, commissions and committees um, around the county. Um, but I do know that a lot of them right now have a lot of uh, slots opened, a lot of vacancies open. So um, I think that's very common, you know, for now these days. So even staffing and, and work positions and stuff. So I just wanted to share that. I don't have anything else to add uh, besides um, that we're looking forward to just continue to, uh, you know, um, interview uh, whoever submits an, an application and um, is interested in joining in the commission. Um, please reach out to me uh, and send me an email. Um, I'm just, um, I'm looking forward to hearing you guys and reading your application. Um, and Austin and Armand, I just want to say thank you so much for your service, your time in our commission. That's all. Back to you, Moreau. Great. Anyone else have any questions for uh, for Roxana or me about uh, membership? Uh, Karen, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, I just had a question. Are we doing, um, I thought, jo Johanna, you had mentioned we were going to be doing a social media campaign for membership yeah we've actually put some things out already oh great yeah. mm -hmm. okay okay great is that in t only in twitter or is it in all the social media platforms well we only have two and so they're on there they've gone out on both and there was two specific one for north county and one for specifically requesting folks from uh, east palo alto and i think that's been successful so far, I think we have two folks in the pipeline for, from East Palo Alto, so I'm excited about that. Yes. Yeah, great. the one application I referred to was someone in East Palo Alto, so that's great. All right, let's, uh, thank you. Let's keep, um, let's keep moving along on the agenda. Um, the, uh, the next part of the agenda was to, you know, or is to uh, swear in Commissioner Nori for a new term and to swear in Amaya Nori and Wesley Lewis, new commissioners. I don't believe that uh, Judge Etazadi has been able to join us yet. So we'll come back to that one. And at this but point- no, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if Amaya is here either. Sotvik, do you know? Yeah, let me check in on that. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay, great. So. At this point, we uh, would pause to invite members of the public uh, to make public comment on any issue that you'd like to bring to the attention of the commission that is not already on the agenda. Uh, so if there are any members of the public that, that, uh, that wanna make public comment, just raise your hand uh, using the reactions button down below in, in your Zoom. Or if you can't find that, feel free to come off mute and say you'd like to make a public comment. I'm going to, uh, Maro, if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to make my last public comment. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, so um, for those of you who didn't know, I serve as a youth advisor to the California Association of Youth Courts and over this past weekend, we held our annual Youth Court Summit. 
which went really well. Two of our plenary speakers were uh, Director Catherine Lucero of the Office of Youth and Community Restoration and uh, Professor Elizabeth Kaufman of UC Irvine. And they, they offered really unique insights to the field of juvenile justice. And I believe that each of you uh, would do well if, if you got a chance to meet them. So I'm really excited about how the summit went and uh, our attendance. And I hope that we can continue to foster a relationship with our partners around the state. Thank you. Great, thank you, Wesley. Anyone else? Uh, Susan, I think you have your hand raised. Uh, I would like to second what Wesley said, and especially, I think it would be, everyone should hear what Dr. Elizabeth Kaufman had to say. It was extraordinary information and every DA, every probation officer, every police chief, sheriff, teacher and parent should hear what she has to say. There is a TED talk that she gives that doesn't have as much information as she gave us on Saturday, uh, but you could check her out there. Uh, her name is spelled Kaufman, C-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. And sorry, Susan is the first name for Susan Elizabeth. Kaufman? Oh, Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth Kaufman, sorry. Yeah, she's a professor at UC Irvine. And, and she was reporting on a work that she did with 1,300 youth offenders that she tracked over seven years and the results that they had based on different treatment that they got, which is surprising. Mm -hmm. Basically, youth who were incarcerated were more likely to offend than youth who were not. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um, then um, any other public comment? All right, great. Hi, hearing none, then uh, let's keep moving along. Um, our first update is also from the court. So we'll wait for Judge Atizadeh to, um, uh, to rejoin or to join uh, once she gets out of court. And uh, we'll come back to uh, to her items. So that leaves um, Ms. Cho from the DA's office, who I did see. Um, go ahead, Ms. Cho. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I supervise the juvenile branch of the district attorney's office. And um, I know some of you do know because you've commented, but uh, on June 7th, there was an election. And if you were a registered voter and you got the ballot and you uh, noticed who was running for the judicial office, um, you would have seen my name there. And so um, I will be starting my term and joining the bench in San Mateo County in in January of next year. Um, I plan to transition out of my current role with the DA's office um, the end of this year. So I have about five months. Um, I won't, uh, you know, make all my comments now because I plan to keep coming to these meetings until then. So I'm sure I'll have you know, more opportunities to, you know, to say things and extend my gratitude um, and to really comment on the tremendous work that I think this commission is doing. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Swope because she just reminded me, you know, she um, is so generous in sharing resources. So not just during these meetings, but, you know, you've sent out emails about, you know, articles that I've read. You recommended a book, Her Honor, which I started listening to on Audible. And so um, I just I just want to thank you for sharing information. And I think um, this is an area that is changing and growing dynamically. And the investment that all of you make is not insignificant. Um, I appreciate seeing, um, you know, people come to the court to observe firsthand. So you're not just reading about things and hearing about things, but I know Commissioner Rasmussen and I know uh, Commissioner Karen who really joined us last time and, and Nori. And so um, I just really appreciate the partnership here and I look forward um, to continuing to be a part of this for, for the next five or so months. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Sharon. Congratulations again. Um, uh, and we're happy that you will continue to be with us uh, for at least the next five months. Uh, great. So next on the agenda, 
uh, is an update from Ron Reyes. And I think that he has not joined and that I did get an email from him with an update. So give me one second. Okay, so uh, Ron Reyes is the managing attorney of the juvenile branch for the private defender program in the county. And he is testifying today in Sacramento in support of AB 2629, uh, which is moving, he says is moving very slowly through the Senate Public Safety Committee. So uh, it looks like he's not done yet. And uh, he did say that he would try uh, to uh, call in after that, um, but let's see. Uh, so maybe when we get to, we do have a legislative update uh, on the agenda later from Commissioner Huber Levy. So we can maybe hear a little bit more about what Ron is doing since he's very active in trying to advance legislation in Sacramento. Uh, so we will get to some of those updates later. That brings us to uh, an update from our partners in probation. Uh, get to kind of let us know what the what the current uh, sort of trends and situation is uh, in the county. So, uh, as usual, I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Stoffer. Good evening, everyone. It's really nice to be here with all of you. Um, <clears throat> Going through our, our current numbers, we have 167 cases in the Assessment Center Investigations Unit, that's our intake unit, and 113 cases in supervision. We have seen a slight increase over the last year in the numbers in the Assessment Center and Investigations Unit. Um, of those new referrals, 15 were um, assigned for diversion, 36 were sent to the DA's office, and two cases were referred out to our youth outreach program for a total of 53 uh, cases that were new referrals for the month of May. We have four youth who are receiving AB12 services. We continue to have zero youth in placement, which we're happy about. And I also wanna say to all of you that participated in the stakeholder meeting last week, thank you so much for your input and um, feedback. We really appreciated your participation. We have one youth at DJJ, uh, 16 DPOs, and 10 youth who have gang orders. That hasn't changed. We have 30 youth who are on EMP. That includes both predispo youth and youth on probation. And then broken down by race, the youth that we serve, 62% uh, are Hispanic Latino, 13% are Black African American, 10% are white, 6% um, are under a category of other race, ethnicity, 5% are Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, 3% are Asian, and one comes up as unknown. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Hi, good evening, Melanie. It's Karen. Good evening. Um, good evening. I just had a, a question um, about uh, two questions, actually. You mentioned the Ascend program last month, and I think you mentioned it that that does that is that an acronym that stands for something? You mentioned it in terms of youth who had been on prior probation, they were their probation was terminated, and they were back with a new offense. Is that correct? So ascend, no, that, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, that we would consider a mandatory send to the DA's office. Oh, so, okay. You yeah. were saying ascend. Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, good. So, to of, of the youth that have been on probation before, we cannot divert those youth. So that would be an yes. automatic send to the DA's office. Yes. Thank you. I was like, oh, a new program. Did I forget about it already? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I got a question on that. What does that acronym stand for? And I was like, wait, where did I get that? I made it up. It was a send. Okay, yes. good to know. And just now you mentioned the outreach, youth so, outreach program. Yeah, youth outreach program is actually a program um, under CFS. 
And so we can refer youth who haven't entered into the system yet um, to receive case management services, referrals to counseling, and then the psychiatric social worker assigned to that program provides both individual family and um, triple P parenting services. So it's a great resource. Oh, wonderful. Great that resource, really yes. Good. Um, and you'd mentioned in informal diversion contracts. Um, oh, yes, I forgot to, thank you. So we have seven youth on contracts currently, five are six month contracts and two are in the 90 day, con under a 90 day contract. Okay. Um, and you had given a, a number of 16 for something as well? Oh. 16 deputy probation officers in the juvenile division. Oh, oh right, 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 okay. Um, and do you have a sense of the gender breakdown overall? Is that something that see. I don't, but we we don't have um, many female youth. I think maybe Jahan, do you have that on your side by chance? If not, I can report out on that next month, Karen. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have it for institutions, not for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I can okay. let you know next month. Yeah, or I can send you an email Thank beforehand you. as well. Oh, sure. That's great. Thank you so much. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. I just, just uh, FYI for, for people who are attending the meeting, I just posted a link to um, the JJDPC's dashboard online. Um, and as we get these numbers each month from Ms. Stauffer, we do, and, and Ms. Clark is gonna go next, we do um, update the, the dashboard. And uh, Amanda Nori, who's joining the commission is, is now taking over um, the updating of that. So he just, he just did update that, it's pretty current. Um, there's also data there that we source from the BSCC, um, which releases data on a quarterly basis. And they actually just recently came up with the most recent uh, data that goes through March. So FYI. That is there. Uh, Ms. Clark, you are, uh, you are up next. Um, this is Superintendent Clark from the uh, Institutions Division and the Youth Service Center. Hi, good evening, everyone. So um, currently we have 17 youth um, in the juvenile hall, 16 males, one female, and three at our girls camp, um, and 23 youth that are on electronic monitoring. We have had a recent, well, we're over it, but we did have um, a COVID scare, or scare is not the right word, but we did have um, COVID cases here that we've recovered for, from. Um, our programming and everything has resumed back to normal. Um, a lot of our protocols, again, just how we've been doing through the pandemic is just working closely with correctional health some of their protocols have changed a little bit, whereas before we might we might have like put the whole institution kind of on quarantine and not let anybody come in. Now, um, what happens is we just kind of everything's secured onto whatever unit might be affected, um, and it doesn't affect any other programming or um, operations on the other units. So, other than that, all is all is well. Any questions? Uh, Commissioner Huber Levy, you beat me to it. Your hand is up. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. Um, I just had a quick question. You mentioned uh, the electronic monitoring. Is that, those are additional youth on electronic monitoring from the number that um, Ms. Stouffer shared with us? Or? No, they're, they're probably, well, we do have some that aren't on um, formal probation. So they're probably, within the same numbers. Oh, okay, so Melanie mentioned 30 and you said 23? So those are... Did she say, did you report on electronic monitoring? This is the latest from today. We have had some releases, so... Oh, okay, okay, so it's the same, it's the same population right. that we're talking about, okay. Okay, Just... sorry, I'm like, this is hot off the press, I called. Yeah, yeah okay, <laughs> we'll go with yours. Ms. Stauffer, what would be the date for your 30. Yeah, so my apologies. I checked um, earlier today, so. <laughs> yeah, releases. 
Thank you, John. So it's a good day for uh, people getting released. <laughs> yes. Getting off right. of okay. electronic monitoring. And I Thank missed you. your report, so I'm sorry for re-reporting, but yeah. Um. Okay, got it. Uh, Ms. Rasmussen, Commissioner Rasmussen, please. Thank you so much. Could we have the breakdown, the racial breakdown of the children who are incarcerated right now? That I would have to report back to you. I don't have those numbers. Thank you. Okay, any I, other? Oh. I think that's a question we always have. Is that right? That we we're always interested in that information, I think. Well, typically you guys have asked for overall probation, not um, not so I'll, I'll okay. keep that information moving forward. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions for Superintendent Clark? We uh, will often to pause for public comment uh, as we go along in the agenda, since um, the initial section public comment is for items that are not on the agenda. But if there's any public comment on what we've heard so far from our, uh, our partners, um, feel free to raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, then. Um, All right. I had public comment. This is Michelle from the Pulse. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Jahan, I'm sorry. Did you say um, you didn't have the numbers of the incarcerated children? No, I don't have the racial breakdown. Our numbers are 17 youth, 16 males, one female, and three at our camp. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next person on our agenda is um, Aurora Pena from Behavioral Health and Recovery Services. And uh, I think she's with us and we have not heard an update from her for a little while. So I asked her to, uh, to come with one today. Aurora, are you there? I am, hello Monroe, hello everybody. Good to be here, nice to see you all. Um, so just a quick update. Um, BHRS, it, we are having some staffing changes just given that we've had one clinician who decided to leave the county and do an early retirement. And she was um, working in the assessment center investigations unit with probation officers. And given that um, we will not be uh, backfilling that position, we have our clinicians who will, we have three clinicians who will be doing a quarterly rotation. Uh, in the assessment investigations unit while they are still, of course, providing individual and family therapy to the other youth in the hall or the community. Um, so that started um, June 13th. That was Linda's last day. And so um, that's changing. We also have um, our interns are wrapping up their academic term with us. We had one leave at the end of May and we have another leaving at the end of this month. So um, it's always nice to have students, but um, they're moving on to bigger and better things in their PsyD or PhD program. So they are also doing that. So that will leave us with three clinicians on the BHRS team. Um, we continue to provide a, uh, so in the juvenile hall as well as Camp Kemp, we do in-person services unless there is a COVID breakdown and, um, you know, out of precaution and following institutions and correctional health lead and advice, um, we will do tele, uh, telehealth sessions. Um, again, unless, um, otherwise it's in person if everything's cleared. Um, in the community, <coughs> and do a hybrid model. We have clients that definitely prefer the in-person. So we offer them that option and that's our preference is to really have the in-person. There are some clients just um, because of work schedules and childcare and just a preference. Um, we will offer the hybrid to them as well, while also encouraging them to come in um, at least once a month in person so that we can have that in-person face-to-face session with them. Um, so that's it there. Um, any questions? Okay, good to see All you. Right. Our normally inquisitive commissioners are, are uh, ha happy with the 
how much uh, of your up, how much detail in your update. So thank you, Aurora. <laughs> uh, and uh, I I want to welcome Judge Atizadi to our meeting. Um, looks like she's uh, able to get over after court. So welcome, Judge Atizadi. Thank you. Thank you. And we will. Um, we're in the middle of you know our series of updates from from county partners. So I'd suggest we'll we'll just continue with the next couple. And then and then turn it over to you to do the swearing in and uh, and provide your update as well. Okay, thank that, you. Sound good. Okay, um, so um, the next uh, update on the agenda is um, is from John Fong from uh, Children and Family Services. Thanks, Monroe. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to see everybody. Um, first, I want to thank all of you who participated in one or more of our uh, uh, county self-assessment focus groups uh, or and or our stakeholder meeting. Uh, really critical that we receive feedback directly from our community and our partners, our system partners uh, in the development of our next system improvement plans. So just really want to appreciate you if you did participate in, in any of those focus groups uh, or the stakeholder meeting that we just held. Uh, I can share some data. Uh, Monroe, is it okay that I share my screen to walk through it? Yeah, I think I need to make you a co-host. So let me just do that for a second. Oh no, uh, I believe Johanna needs to do that because I'm not the host. There we go. It's showing that he has co-host. Okay, great. All right, hoping you all see what I see here. Do you see a report saying uh, San Mateo County Human Services Agency? Yep, okay. Thank you, Janae, I see ya. Um, okay, so placement data uh, for children and family services, 135 uh, young people in care. This includes our non-minor dependents. Uh, In-county rate is at 58% about, give or take. If you look, open that up to the larger Bay Area counties, we're almost at 82%. Uh, in the Bay Area, uh, about 18.5% in other counties outside of the contiguous Bay Area. Uh, that's these counties listed here. Uh, previously, you, uh, last meeting, uh, you all had asked and requested for a breakdown um, by race ethnicity for out-of-county numbers. So here we have in-county, um, you know, 78 of, of the 135 in-county uh, about 13% Asian Pacific Islander, 15.4% Black, uh, almost 50% uh, Latinx, and 23% White. If we go out of county, the uh, clearly the percentage of Latino youth of our out of county youth um, are Lat Latinx, uh, Asian Pacific Islander at 10 or 10.5%, 10 Black 15.8%, pretty consistent, and White at 8.8%. Uh, minors in placement, uh, this is a breakdown, um, disaggregating by, by age. So these are uh, young people under the age of 18. Uh, in county, this is looking a lot better, uh, almost at 66%, about a 34% out of county rate. Uh, we're doing much better there um, as a jurisdiction, as a local jurisdiction. Uh, if we look at um, the Bay Area County, it's pretty consistent with the overall numbers, about 82%. Uh, within the Bay Area and almost 18% out, uh, out of the Bay Area. Look at our older population. These are our young adults, non-minor dependents. Um, and we're doing better here. I know the number is still a bit high here, but at 55% out of county, 45% in county. Again, still having around 80% in the Bay Area for this age category as well. Uh, this is race, race and ethnicity uh, broken down um, by minor by age as well, uh, as well as uh, race ethnicity. So if we look here, um, we have uh, Asian Pacific Islander 10.7%. This is overall placement, 14% uh, Black, 50% Latino and 16.7% white. Uh, if we look at our non-minors, 13.7% uh, Asian Pacific Islander, 17.6% black, 
51% uh, Latino uh, and white 17.6%. Okay, so this is not broken down out of county, in county, this is just our overall population. Uh, those with uh, relative caregivers, um, doing better here as well. So we're, we're, we're improving in this category, uh, nearing that 40% target of young people placed with relatives. Uh, and then again, here down here uh, are young people with um, you know, complex care needs. Uh, these are STRTP level of care young people. We have six total. Um, broken down in thirds uh, between Black, Latino, and White. Uh, Karen had reached out um, recently and asked that we break this down by gender. I was not able to do that and prepare for this meeting and this report, but I'll, I'll, I'll work to do that for the next report out. Uh, I did seek out overall numbers for young people in placement, the 135 total, and found that 62%, uh, about 62% are female as opposed to the 38% male in placement currently. That includes our non-minor dependents uh, overall population. And open to any questions that you all might have. Um, John, could, that... you, um, could you sh continue sharing uh, just while we go through questions? Sure. So John, you have more uh, girls than boys who are out of placement and is that because of greater reporting rates or more sexual violence against girls do you have it can you talk about that a little bit yeah you know we haven't um analyzed the data in that depth mm -hmm. uh quite yet uh, i can tell you that um it's probably not in care rates are probably not due to sexual abuse specifically uh, an increased number of of females in care. We would have to look at it a little bit closer, uh, Melissa, for me to come to any uh, sort of uh, conclusions or uh, make any connections in the data uh, as it relates to the gender specifically. Thank you. Sure. Hey, John, could you scroll back down to the kind of the middle there? Because I'm pretty sure I had a question, but I'm trying to remember what it was. Does anyone else have any questions while... Uh... I have a quick question on the um, short-term residential therapeutic program. Is that, where, where is that? What facility are we talking about? It's NESTRTP. So uh, what I can say is I believe all but one are placed at either Canyon Oaks or Lesion STRTP, which are county administered STRTPs and one outside of that. Sorry, Canyon Oaks I'm familiar with. And what was the other one? Elysian SDRTP, uh, Human Services Agency, my agency administers that program. Oh, okay. I'm gonna ask a naive question. Uh, why, why do we have the Canyon Oaks mandate, but not all STRTPs? Can you say more, Melissa, in terms of a mandate? Well, so, you know, we have to do, um, as a commission, we have to do in uh, our yearly reports for youth in a locked facility. And that includes Canyon Oaks. I didn't even know about this other facility. And so I'm just wondering why we don't have that as part of our- Inspections. Inspections, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, so, so Canyon Oaks uh, serves a greater population in their program statement. They serve the schools, they serve probation. They also serve child welfare uh, mm -hmm. youth. Um, Elysian STRTP is specifically for uh, those young people who fall under welfare and institutions. Code 300 are dependent youth, non-probation youth. These are dependent youth uh, who are under the jurisdiction of children and family services under dependency. Okay. Isn't that in, in what was the receiving home? It was, it was. So as a result of CCR, um, uh, AB uh, 403, um, you know, shelter care as we knew it historically, um, there was really a, a very strong move away from shelter care or uh, transitional uh, shelters uh, as such. So we made the decision back then to move to an STRTP model. Mm -hmm. um, and so where is that facility to... located? It's on Tower Road, just down. Is that the old receiving home? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We used to we used to do the receiving home as part of our inspections. Hmm. Uh, Johanna, I see your hands up. I just wanted to recognize um, 
John for his tremendous work and and meeting, you know, approaching these goals. And I know that your job and that your your team is a very very difficult job to do. And I just want to recognize the work that you do and um, how you're re you're you're getting to these goals. And so I just want to express my appreciation for that. Thank you, John. Thank you, Joanna. Really appreciate it. And John, you're also bringing a lot just by being here. So we really appreciate it. Absolutely. No worries at all. And, def and definitely one of the mo best and most detailed reports each month. So we appreciate that. Uh, great. Let's, uh, if there aren't any other questions for, um, for John, then, uh, then we will turn now to the County Office of Education and, um, and then we will get to Judge Atizadi. So uh, Janae, did you have any updates for us? Yes, good evening. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, just wanted to provide some current numbers on our programs. Um, we are in the middle of summer school. We have 16 students enrolled at Hillcrest, nine students enrolled at Canyon Oaks, three students currently enrolled at Camp Kemp. And um, while we do not run summer school at Gateway, we do have nine students that are scheduled to return to Gateway starting in the fall. I don't yet have the final referral numbers for our new therapeutic program. Um, we've been receiving quite a few referrals, but we have to analyze and assess appropriate fit and they have to go through IEP meetings, et cetera. So hopefully in the fall, we'll have a full classroom of students um, that we're serving. Primarily at that point, we'll be looking to serve um, middle school students. That's definitely what we've been hearing from our districts when it comes to uh, services around therapeutic programming. They felt like middle school programs or students really could benefit from this. So we'll keep you updated there. Um, and we are happy that Project Change came today, met with some students and are exploring interest. And so we'll be doing our regular up and running, getting Project Change up and going, hopefully in the summer school. Um, and then as we look at some other work at the County Office of Education, as, as this team knows, we do, uh, we have the, safe, the Coalition for Safe Schools and Communities, and so we provide lots of supports across the county in the area of suicide prevention, human trafficking prevention, mental health supports, um, just a variety of what we call safety nets. And one of those includes the, the threat assessments, and I do just want to share that our threat assessment team has been quite busy um, and each district does their own internal level one, but if a threat appears a little more concerning and needs some more comprehensive teams around the, we have our partners here, Child and Family Services participates, BHRS, our probation partners. So we all come together and support districts as they're you know, looking to analyze potential threats to campus. And, um, really feel happy and grateful that we have invested in this work and we're one of the few places that do this work and um after the latest re you know shooting in uvalde lots of legislators are looking to try to mandate districts to do this work so just really proud that we've been doing this work voluntarily with all of our partners meeting every monday um, if we don't have a case, we don't meet, but more often than not, we're meeting on Mondays to review at least one and sometimes multiple cases. And sometimes we even call multiple meetings a week. So just want to share with this group that we're doing everything we can to proactively support students in distress to keep our schools safe. And a big focus is to try to intervene early to support somebody in crisis, but also to hopefully divert them from any, you know, system involvement and consequences while we're we're meeting their needs and keeping everyone else safe. That's fantastic and very timely. Thank you, Janae. Mm -hmm. Did anyone have any questions for Ms. Luttrell? Sasha, Ms. Commissioner Newton, go ahead. Hi, Janae. Uh, thank you so much for that. I'm just curious about the threat assessment um, having, I guess, worked in a school and seeing the on the ground level. Um, I'm curious, like, are there ever times where students fly below the radar that there's not sort of a, a big thing that flags them? And, and then how do we support them that way? Say if they're like um, 
being trafficked, but they don't have any clear indicators of disciplinary action or other mm -hmm. things that may call attention to adults? So good question. Um, if you're talking about threats and possible threats to others, what research shows is that typically there's what's called leakage. So the, typically it, we can do an autopsy and analyze and determine that whenever a student has been violent, typically there's been some type of leakage that others have seen, and then we activate a threat assessment. When it comes to CSEC or students that are potentially being trafficked, exactly what you said, Sasha, we might see warning signs or red flags. And while we train schools on here are the risk factors that potentially puts a student more likely to be trafficked, although we have numerous students that also presume, you know, in at least on face value, don't even have a lot of risk factors. However, research in our experience does show that disproportionately they do have um, risk factors that folks are able to see, um, you know, unstable housing, um, behavioral changes, you know, just any vulnerabilities that an exploiter might be able to take, take advantage of. But exactly what you said, um, oftentimes we will get a sense that somebody is either at risk of being trafficked or we might even get indications that somebody is actively being trafficked. And we do everything we can to try to build relationships with that student, get that student connected, activate our partner. So grateful to Child and Family Services. They run an MDT every week. And so we would refer that case to this MDT team and a multidisciplinary group looks at what's going on with that student and ways we can support the student. But it's oftentimes just you know, seeing some smoke and not knowing necessarily if there's really a fire, but not wanting that to go, you know, unmonitored and trying to get in there to prevent or intervene as much as we can. Great. Thank you so much. All right. If there aren't any other questions for Janae, um, we will come back to Judge Etazadi now. Um, Your Honor, uh, you have the floor. There are three commissioners to swear in, one for new terms, two for new terms. And then of course, uh, if you have any updates on what's happening at the court, we'd love to hear it. So I uh, will turn it over to you to uh, take those in whatever order you want. Thank you, Monroe. Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody is well. Uh, well, as it relates to court updates, we continue to use a hybrid model for our hearings on the juvenile justice side and on the dependency side. For some of you who may be new to the commission, we have two judges here in San Mateo County, myself and Judge Cadet, and we do both. We do juvenile justice and dependency. And on the juvenile justice side, we employ the hybrid model, which means that um, folks can appear via Zoom on pretrials, arraignments, dispositions, but anytime we have a contested hearing set, for example, a contested jurisdictional hearing or a contested dispositional hearing, we require that people appear in person. Now, if the parties stipulate, the attorneys stipulate, or if there's a witness that lives out of town or out of state and everybody agrees, that witness may also appear via Zoom. And we do the same thing on the dependency side. Uh, that's John Fung, he, he talks about that. If we have a contested hearing, we require that the parties appear in court. But for other hearings, uncontested jurisdictional dispositional hearings, um, it's all right by us for parties to appear via Zoom. We find this model to be effective because it's in the best interest of families and children. Um, children don't have to leave school. They can step out of class or, or be home. But the only requirement is, of course, if the hearings are contested, meaning there's going to be testimony, then we do require in-person appearances. So it's worked well, it's worked well for a while now, and we're going to continue to use the hybrid model. Does anyone have any questions about that model? Okay, uh, so it is really an honor for me to swear in. We have two new commissioners and then we're, uh, and then Savik Nuri was, um, reappointed. So I'm going to ask Wesley Liu and Amaya Nori and Savik Nori to all raise your hands, please. <clears throat> I can't see you, so I'm going to assume that your hands are raised. Are they raised, Monroe?
You're muted, Monroe. But yes, they're raised. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm going oh. to ask. You were muted, Monroe. Sorry. Yeah. You know what? Uh, I wanted to just quickly add that yeah. uh, that Amaya is actually on a summer program that took him to uh, to Turkey. Uh, uh, and he is zooming in from the wee hours of the morning because he can't wait to get started on the, uh, on the commission. Uh, so Wild. Uh, that's wonderful. Well, uh, I commend him for that. <laughs> Such dedication, oh, man, that's amazing. <laughs> zooming in from Turkey to be sworn in. That's really awesome. Very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> uh, so is everyone's hands uh, raised at this time? Raise your right they hand. Are. They okay. Are. So I'd like each of the three of you to state your name, please. Uh, I am Sophic Nori. I am Man Nori. I am Wesley Liu. Very well. So I'm going to read the oath. And if you agree, at the end of the oath, I want you to say, I do. So do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties I am about to enter. If you agree, Please state, I do. I do. I do. Congratulations. I'm so proud of all three of you. And I'm very much looking forward to working with the three of you. Thank you for this honor. All right, so I have the oath. So what I'm going to do is sign them. And then I'm going to return them to Adriana so that each of you can actually sign uh, the oath. OK, so that may take a few days. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Uh, My pleasure. And uh, and thank you for the efficiency as well. Uh, we are um, tracking right on time, uh, which is which is an accomplishment for this commission. Uh, we usually have pretty packed agenda, and um, and our next our next uh, section is updates from commissioners on all the work that they're doing. Uh, we do have time at the end of the meeting to get to a discussion of um, assigning commissioners to potential new projects. But I just wanna note that, uh, that we actually have quite a few things in motion now. Uh, and so that's why there is actually a pretty significant list of, of updates from commissioners from the work that they're doing now. Uh, and so hopefully we can get to talking about new projects. Um, and then maybe even sometime this year, we might have a guest speaker like we have had in the past. Um, but since, uh, since when commissioners do go out and do work on behalf of the commission during the month in between public meetings, um, we do want them to, uh, to come back and tell us what they've been doing uh, and report on it. Um, we're prioritizing that. All right. So with that, let's get to uh, let's get to updates from commissioners on the work that they're doing. And in the lead spot uh, this month, uh, because I think we have some uh, some significant news, is the uh, Pierpoint project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so so I I assume is it Commissioner Wilson? You're are you going to take that, or who who's going to who's going to lead this off? Uh, sure, but it, it's a team effort, as with all things. So, um, so the big news is that after lots of hard work, we were able to get a five hundred thousand dollar grant from Gilead Foundation. Um, so Gilead's like my new oh. favorite company, um, and it's for three years. And it will that plus the money we've already raised will managed to launch a pilot. So this really will be happening. And then the second exciting piece of news, which makes the this really will be happening even more likely is that Fly is going to run PeerPoint. Um, so it will be transitioning from our child in a JJDPC project 
over to fly in the next few months. Um, all the original team is going to stay at, as advisors, um, although not necessarily as JJDPC advisors. Um, and the, their vision is much in keeping with what we've been going for. So um, if you like the idea, the plans before, you'll like the idea and plans going forward. Um, this obviously does involve the JJDPC because this is a JJDPC project. And so I'm not sure whether we need to be asking permission. Um, Gilead has signed off on that transition. Um, Fly's executive staff has approved the transition. And so whatever we need to be released, um, <laughs> I'm, request I'm formally requesting. <laughs> I think, uh, so I'm happy to discuss with the commission. If anyone disagrees, um, please uh, please jump in. But um, I think that since at this point, you really have, it really throughout this, you've been, my word is kind of incubating this and, and guiding it and moving it along. And in doing that, uh, have also, uh, you know, worked with other organizations to provide fiscal sponsorship. Uh, and so, you know, the recipients of this grant money and so forth are legal entities that are separate from the from the commission. Uh, um, I don't think, honestly, I don't think there's anything for us to vote on. Uh, but if there are other commissioners that disagree with that, uh, I, I'm, 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 of course, happy to hear the discussion. But um, my suggestion would be that as you continue, as it, it still does need to be guided and you all will still be uh, involved uh, and until it kind of gets up and running in its new place and with its new funding, we'd love to hear, hear about it. And then of course, even after that, uh, just as Fly comes to our meetings and, pro and provides input and updates, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to hear what's happening with PeerPoint. That's, that's, my, that's my point of view. Uh, are there any commissioners that um, they want to add anything or that, you know, have a different point of view? Is there something that we should be voting on? I don't think there is. Commissioner Rasmussen, please go ahead. Thank you. So I, it's just for clarification. So there'll be the, the um, original team will be advising on their own time. And so this project is wrapping up for the commission. Is that right? So it frees them up to work on other projects or, or is that, am I not understanding and, and it remains a JGDC project that our commissioners will be focused on. What does that look like? Um, I, I can give you a little bit of information on that. I think we're not quite at the point where we're all free. Um, what we've just learned on Monday is that the grant is going to be given to PeerPoint. Um, we are still uh, in a fiscal sponsorship agreement with San Francisco Study Center. And we still need to specifically set out the terms of the arrangement with FLY. So we're giving you the kind of heads of agreement here. The, here's the plan going forward. But in the next probably couple months, we will be ensuring that there's a smooth transition. And the idea going forward is that the youth leadership team will continue to be actively involved and engaged. And a number of us, have agreed to be supportive where there needs to be support. So it won't be, you know, after the next few months, it will not be the heavy lifting that we've been doing. So we will, you know, yes, have capacity in terms of, I don't know, work stream, but, um, but, if you're but we will still stay interested. And, if and if you're trying to put like a date in your mind, I would say like October will get us through all these transitions. We have to go back to every granting agency and make that all happen and get uh, fly will launch and we need to get that launch going, et cetera, et cetera. So there's actually quite a bit of work still to do, but. And yeah. wherever we can make this, you know, more successful and have more opportunity through the personal contacts, especially that, you know, Melissa and Austin and Sasha have been working on so steadily over the past couple of years, you know, we'll continue to do that because we really are, we'll continue to be spiritually invested in this and make sure that it has the best possible opportunity for um, sustainability 
because it's it's still kind of a pilot. It, it'll it'll run for the next couple of years through Fly, but um, you know it needs to be nurtured still. And there are some relationships I think that will be, you know, we will be effective. But we'll yeah we'll shift to the point where we'll use our contacts to advocate for Fly for sorry PeerPoint as a Fly program. I, I think there's still some some things to be worked out with Fly. Uh, I think we need to make sure that the young people who've been putting this together still have a say so more than just advisory. Yeah. And I think, I think we also need to ensure that it is a peer um, activity and that they don't put in that you have to be 18 or older to, to be one of the um, people in the, in the circle. That also, would be there shocking. Some, there's some things that need to be worked out. But. And, and we did have a very good, uh, Frank, and it's too bad that Kate Heaster's, uh, she's on vacation, so she's not at our meeting today, but we did have a very um, full and frank discussion with the youth leadership team and Kate prior to, you know, proceeding with this, because it was clearly extremely important for the youth leadership to continue to be engaged and they all unanimously said they want to continue to be involved because they're learning so much. And they were very excited about the opportunity to learn with an organization like Fly too. Just so- That's, um, that's very helpful because we're gonna be talking later about projects and what our capacity is. So, and it, I haven't been involved in this project. So it's difficult for me to gauge like mm -hmm. where the lines are and, and what's happening. So I appreciate the clarification. I, I think we should stay involved at least until the, the pilot is up and running and has had some young people go through the process mm -hmm. and we, we see how, it, how it's going. Mm -hmm. Definitely makes sense. And, and that reminds me just uh, for any members of the public that are here that, that maybe only come and hear about PeerPoint once a month, can you just a quick reminder, what is PeerPoint exactly? Uh, Commissioner sure. Wilson. Sure. Um, PeerPoint is a, di a diversion from the school to prison pipeline that focuses on youth who would otherwise be experiencing exclusionary suspension for school infractions or for youth post arrest in communities where they do not have a local diversion program. So uh, a police officer could refer them to this program rather than having the youth enter probation, probate, the probation department where um, you know, by state law, they develop a record. So in our county, there's a patchwork of local diversion programs and we're trying to with this as, a, as an option for all communities. Um, that's the big, the big picture. And then the smaller picture is we're going to start in one or two places and then build from there. I, I think it should be open to any child facing suspension or expulsion it and, is. and to any child that has a first offense um, yes. anywhere, any, even if it, it, the diversion programs are different and it may be that different youth would be better served by one of the other existing programs. Mm -hmm. But I think they should also be able to refer to PeerPoint where that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's terrific, and and you know, hearing that description, uh, I think is helpful to repeat um, because it just reminds me what a significant contribution you've all made uh, uh, to put this together to attract this much funding for it, um, and uh, you know, we wish you the best of luck getting it over the finish line uh, and and growing it in the future. So. I see, Sotvik, did you have a question about PeerPoint? Yeah, I had a Diana, You had your hand up, but uh, I don't know, put it down. Oh, I just have a really quick question. So like, I might, I might just be behind on this, but I remember like originally the plan was to do a pilot with like the Sequoia Union High School District. So do you have any details or is it too early to like, is that still gonna happen or like- Yeah, gonna... so our grants, uh, at least two of our grants are specific to Menlo Atherton High School or a Sequoia Union High School. So that is kind of built into the transfer of relationship to fly. They will be working in Sequoia Union High School District. Um, and we were going to launch uh, at Menlo Atherton High School in May, but then we had a hiring problem. And so we didn't launch then, but it's still on the books. It's still planned. 
Roxana, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, um, Commissioner Wilson, for the um, for the update. I'm very excited about this. Um, and I want to learn more. I know there's a lot of information um, that um, you know we're not always aware of. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how are you guys going to be educating like police departments uh, that yeah. there is this peer point, uh, you know, out there um, or even in the pipeline? Just because um, yeah. right now, for example, in Redwood City, uh, we have a lot of youth uh, issues that are happening um, and you know, that they're trying to work things out with youth down there in downtown Redwood City. Um, and we, we are being told by police departments, you know, in Redwood City, with the police department in Redwood City. Mm -hmm. Just a disclaimer, I'm also in the police advisory committee in Redwood City. So that's why I'm sharing this um, because we're hearing so much about youth and how uh, some police officers are just, you know, having to arrest the youth because of, you know, bat assault or, you know, fireworks and all that stuff. So um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, when are you, if you guys will, I, I'm so glad that Jennifer's here as well, with Jennifer Martinez, and I'm just like interested in kind of learning, you know, how would you guys collaborate together, I guess. We've already talked to every police department in the county and the sheriff's department. And, and in some cases, more than once. Yeah. So, yeah. so what, what what we've done to police? So Su Susan's team talked to every police department. Austin was on that team. Then Austin and I did a presentation to all the school resource officers about a year ago. Then Sasha organized and uh, brought a restorative justice program to all the school resource officers about four or five months ago. Um, so, and we're planning to continue to engage. The one limitation on, and, and we're, our, our team is gonna go uh, visit Christina, um, can't, oh, what's her, what's her last name? The new- Corpus. Yeah, thank you, the new um, sheriff. The limitation on impacting the system is money. And FLY is going to be putting 30 youth through its program the first year and then ramp up from there. And I think that's like a, a reasonable and good prudent way to go about it, but it of course limits the number of youth. So there is a problem with advertising something that you can't fully deliver. Um, and Fly is going to have to sort of lead through that process, but the, the Daily City would be our next high priority, our, our next police department that we'd be prioritizing because there's nothing there. Um, there's nothing in South San Francisco um, or, uh, and I think San Bruno, if that's right. Um, so anyway, so the answer is yes, we want to continue to engage police. Fly will have some say about that and the number of slots available has a lot to do with how much engagement we can do. Yeah, got it. And also yeah. um, I just wanna comment like just you know, I sit, uh, I listen to a lot of school, school board meetings, like Sequoia Union District meetings, um, and Redwood City School District, you know, the elementary and middle schools. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, I hear conversations about how demographics are shifting away mm -hmm. because of rise of housing. And I'm wondering, you know, how this might affect, you know, the peer point court moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, that's just a comment and a thought that I just wanted to share. You, you mean in terms of the socioeconomics of the youth who yes. are participating? Is that, yeah, I mean, it, it, affects, it affects everything. But I, but I think, you know, for good or for bad, there are so many youth in our county that have need of a program like this. So um, it's, it, it's really like, it's a limit, there are limitless opportunities to serve. So we just have to have limitless funds. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, uh, use the funds that we have to uh, uh, launch a great pilot and keep attracting more. I mean, yeah. I think what we're really trying to do in the first two years is say, hey, here is the vision. And now let's, let's really, really do this, right? So what we would like, you know, the county support we had did not translate into dollars. And so obviously we need to get the dollars to show up at some point to have this be the, 
the universal solution, you know, a, a solution that allows for universal um, use diversion. Yeah, diversion. Not the universal solution, but a solution that allows for universal diversion of youth. Yeah, and I will just add that <clears throat> this um, this project has been uh, very much born out of collaborations with many, many people. Um, and that's what's allowed it to succeed. Um, and FLY also has four counties um, that they operate in. Um, and so it could be a great opportunity for us to connect with other JJDPCs in other counties. I know that's already on our agenda um, of projects and then sort of Grow. all the projects coalesce um, to sort of proliferate diversion um, more broadly. Fantastic. Um, I, I uh, will also note that outside of the commissioners that have worked on this project, um, obviously Commissioner Willis has been involved from very early on. Uh, he, I think he he's, dropped off. He's ground uh, zero. Yeah. yeah. And, and he, uh, as you mentioned before, you mentioned um, youth, I think you call it youth committees, uh, but there are, are a, a significant number of uh, high school students that are working on this with you and doing a lot of the work. Um, yeah. He recruited over 80 students from all over the county yeah. and he's been training them and they've been doing online circles and they've are begun doing in-person circles. Yeah. And I want to highlight two of those youths who are Amea and Wesley. Who are our new commissioners. Yes. Fantastic. Full circle. Full circle. Uh, uh, okay, great. I think that's a good time. I saw if I see your hands up. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to that. say quickly, oh, very quickly. I just thought it's like really cool because I still remember four years ago when I was a sophomore in high school and the old chair, Michelle, came to the Youth Commission and was like, the JDPC is really interested in starting a peer court. So four years later, it's cool to see it finally happen. Yeah, wow. That's great. That's great history. Thank you, Suffolk. Um, I think this is a good time we haven't paused for a while for public comment. Uh, if there are any members of the public that have questions or comments about uh, PeerPoint or, or some of the other things that we've already covered, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, that's fine too. Um, uh, just wanna make sure that we have, uh, have the opportunity to do that. All right, so let's um, thank you, PeerPoint team, and uh, congratulations again on the significant new funding that's gonna really get this off the ground. Uh, so we look forward to hearing more in future months. Uh, let's move to um, Commissioner Rasmussen. I'm gonna give you the floor in just a minute. Um, there are a few things that in a row um, that are uh, next on the agenda. I'll just very quickly um, cover mine, which is on the list as well. So if you look in the agenda, everyone, um, the Reimagine Juvenile Hall Committee has not met since the last meeting, but one of the things that the, since, sorry, since the last JGDPC meeting, but one of the things that the, uh, that at the last Reimagine Juvenile Hall Committee we talked about was looking for quick wins, opportunities to do, you know, something um, uh, uh, like pro smaller projects uh, to improve conditions in the in in uh, the YSC, and one of the opportunities that was brought to us was uh, uh, the potential for applying for a jumpstart grant uh, to um, to fund some kind of uh, fine arts program or to do something like paint a mural uh, inside the hall. Uh, and the deadline for that was June 23rd, which is just unfortunately kind of too quick. And uh, the team, we did get a team together to brainstorm some ideas and, and that included uh, Alan Bustos, who is with us uh, and who spoke last time about, uh, about this. So we're gonna keep working on ideas and, uh, and apply in the next uh, round of, of grant applications, which is in the fall. Uh, so that's just an update on on that arts grant that we talked about last time. All right, Commissioner Rasmussen, there are several several things that you're working on as well that uh, that we'd love to hear hear about and hear updates on. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. 
So our outreach to underserved communities and youth has sort of been on um, life support for like the last 10 months. It was a project that Commissioner Talleria and I started. And um, about 10 months ago, the partnership sort of, you know, um, dissolved. And so I've sort of been carrying that forward in the best of my ability as as one person. So I just, it's been a while since we've reported on it and we're gonna be recruiting folks. So I'm hopeful that um, I can give an update and maybe encourage some of you to volunteer for this very important project. So on uh, last Thursday, I had a meeting with supervisor David Canepa and uh, talked to him about the need for translation services at our meetings monthly, as well as our meetings in the community. And so he's committed to helping us uh, get those services. So that is underway. That's a very important, uh, the majority of the uh, families we serve are Spanish speaking. So it's imperative that we have a, an ability to communicate with them. So um, in addition to that, um, I attend community meetings uh, to raise awareness about the commission about juvenile justice in San Mateo County. Um, we've started a closed closet. Uh, Judge Edizadi often says to the children, when you change your thinking, you change your behavior. And so with that in mind, uh, we created a closed closet for the children at the hall. So they have clothes to wear to court because when you dress yeah. for court, right, it, it elevates your self-esteem. You're no longer just wearing the, the jail clothing. You're actually wearing um, you know, you're wearing really nice clothes. So what we provide is a shirt, a tie, pants, belt, shoes, socks, undershirt, um, and belt. So, um, and we've been reaching out to the community to accept those donations. And so that's really, um, and then they get to take that outfit with them when they leave. So they have an outfit to wear, you know, if there's a special event or a job interview. So we're working on, um, that's something that I've been working on that's been um, pretty successful. We, um, when I say we, there's different commissioners who will help me on certain things because I'm just one person. Recently, we go, we attend events. So recently, Commissioner Nori Bocanegra and myself, we attended the funeral for the young man who, whose life was taken in East Palo Alto. And so we were present there for the kids and the community and the high school students to let them know that we, that we're in the community, we're there for them, they need support. We're working with the with folks from the school district to see how they can provide support for these students. And um, let me see if I'm missing anything else. Um, so I think that basically um, covers uh, what we've been doing. Of course, I do as much outreach as possible on social media, but we really need a dedicated team with COVID now uh, wrapping up. We really need a dedicated team that can commit to going out and holding our own meetings in the community. And, and preferably that would be members of our commission who are bilingual, who could do that. And so when we, talk about projects later on. I, I'm really hopeful that we can get a, a new group of folks in here to do this very, very important work. So thank you for allowing me to give an update. Does anyone have any questions? I see Sasha's hand is up. Thank you, Sa Commissioner Newton. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you. What you contribute to this commission is amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask about the clothing closet that's I love that idea. Um, and if we as commissioners want to contribute, how, how would we go about that? So my husband has built a closet for me in the garage. And so you're, you can drop them off. And then as the children need the clothes, um, we go in and we measure them. Then I can drop them off for court up at the hall. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And um, without waiting to get to that that agenda item of new projects. Um, I would just encourage if anyone uh, wants to get involved in commu more community outreach and like Commissioner Rasmus just mentioned, like one of the original ideas for this, uh, this project was when we were able to go out and actually hold our own meetings um, in addition to attending others. So uh, I would just say contact Commissioner Rasmussen if you're interested in getting involved. Uh, uh, Johanna, keep going. You're, uh, I think you're next on the uh, on the agenda anyway to give an update on the gang prevention project. Okay, so um, we we've had two meetings so far, and we are we've now um, broken down our categories, and we are getting to work on our interviews. I actually had an opportunity to speak with an expert today 
um, just by chance. I just happened to come across an expert. So the good things are happening. We're, we're gathering data, we're doing research, we're setting up our interviews and um, our project is really sort of taken flight. Monroe, do you have anything you wanna add no, yeah, just that, just just to let everyone know that the project is is going, and um, we're in the research phase. So, um, uh, we're the group that is working on this is kind of fanning out and uh, and reaching out to um, to people to who have knowledge of of uh, of gang enhancements, gang activity in the county, so and so on. Uh, I see Commissioner Huber Levy's hand is up. Yes. Hi. I just have a question of the kind of the lens through which you're approaching your research. Is it to understand the extent of activity of gangs pertaining to juveniles in our county? And is it also, I sense the concern is also that some young members of our community may be profiled as gang members. So there's a sense of wanting to not have that happen. So I'm just wondering, is that is there a particular um, issue that you're trying to solve at this well, point or is it just very broad? Thank you for that question. So we actually had a project description that was out in the last agenda, I, maybe the agenda before that explains all of the details of the project. So it's really wide. We're looking to find out who are the gangs? Who's participating in the gangs? What neighborhood are the gangs in? How does a child get into the database, the gang database? Can they ever get out of it? Um, you know, what types of crimes are being committed by these gangs? Um, we're basically looking at all of that. We're looking at programs, what's been tried and failed, what's been tried and is successful, and are there new programs that we can uh, look to implementing that um, are like cutting edge programs? So it's all of the above, really. So it's really, um, an extensive list of things. And, and what we're trying to do is identify all of these things to, be, uh, to uh, hopefully reduce violent juvenile crime um, in San Mateo County, to better understand it, to provide the services and intervention so we can reduce violent crime in San Mateo County. Does that answer your question? So when I, uh, yeah, I guess so. Me, I would I mean, add, uh, uh, Karen, I would just add that um, I think we're trying to cast a broad net now um, to figure out what what we you know what we don't what we don't know right like so we're not trying to narrow yet until yeah. we have a chance to talk to a bunch of people and 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 see what we learn so um but those both those things you mentioned of of trying to understand is there actual activity um we know there is right uh and, but also are there some people that are maybe some youth that are maybe profiled and as as, as I think we've mentioned this meeting and before, you know, maybe they uh, are targeted as a gang member when they might not, maybe they aren't, they aren't. So we just wanna understand as much as we can. And you probably should talk to the people on the gang task force. But Definitely I know on our list, yeah. Uh, there are a, a number of youth who've told me that they've been uh, told, put on the gang list and they say, I'm not, with the gang. I live in a neighborhood that has a gang and some of the gang members are my neighbors. And I, they, I think they feel they've been put on the gang list because they were seen with somebody who was a known gang member, but they may not be gang members themselves. Yeah, these are all good questions. And, and really we're at the, the, I think the main point of our update is that we're at the beginning here uh, and, and trying to learn as much as we can. Karen, your hand's still up. You, oh, you sorry, I don't know why it's, I thought it just naturally falls down at some point, but um, I'll, I will take it down, but I just wanted to, I'm, oh yeah, no, it's still not lowering. Yes, it's gone. Still, I, um, I just, no, cause I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around where, where the issues are too, just understanding the demographics of youth and uh, the demographics and the characteristics of the youth who are touched by juvenile justice in San Mateo County. And there's about 300 it seems at any point in time. And there's only 10 who are under the, you know, intensive supervision the for gang. gang. Yeah. yeah. So, but maybe the, maybe the issues are much more embedded. And, but if we're talking about, we're concerned with violent crime through gangs, where are they? We're trying to wrap our head around that as well, I would say. So, um, uh, Commissioner Rustin, did you have anything else you wanted to add or, or uh, 
can we move on to uh, update on ins on inspections? I think we can move on. Thank you for the assist there, Commissioner uh, Labuise. Okay, okay. Sure. so um, inspection. So we did have a couple events uh, this month. Uh, we had the, uh, there was some COVID over at the YSC. So that uh, sort of prevented uh, going into on, on one level anyway. And we did have the fire in Redwood City, which I understand caused the evacuation of our Canyon Oaks facility. But as far mm -hmm. as we are uh, ready to go, um, all of the inspection information is located in the Google Drive of our folder. Each team should have all of their information. And the time would be now while, we, while we're clear with COVID and uh, it would be time for the teams to make the initial connections and start the inspection process. So that's uh, basically where that is. Um, and if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. I'll just comment that I just got back from being out of town for two weeks and uh, on my to-do list tomorrow to uh, get started on the, the part of the inspections that I'm working on. Same, same, just back in town and- Ready to go. Thank you. Thank you for the prompt. <laughs> and if anybody hasn't already signed up for an inspection, um, last call, please do so <laughs> as soon as possible. Thank you. Johanna, am I allowed to sign up and how do I sign up? So you should have access to the Google Drive and we can talk offline about just specifically, um, there's always a way that we can work on the inspections together, even if there's certain facilities that you're not able to go into. There's still things that you can work on to assist the project. The, the one, the, the YSC facility inspection list is, is full. So that's really not an issue at this point. Um, so we're really, I think we're looking for folks to go into uh, Canyon Oaks needs a spot and maybe Camp Kemp might need a spot. So those would be the open spots, but I'm happy to talk with you offline, but all the signups are in the Google Drive under inspections for 2022. And I'll check to make sure you're, you're uh, have access to the Google Drive, uh, Wesley. Um, got added that to my list for tomorrow. I think I do. Yeah, I think I showed that with him already. Okay, good. All right, any other comments or questions on inspections? Thank you for keeping us moving along, uh, Johanna. Um, now the next uh, there the next few updates are from Karen. Uh, so you, go ahead, Commissioner Heber Levy. Thank you, Monroe. Uh, okay, so on the after school programs advocacy, uh, which is um, it, the advocacy part of this is focused mostly right now on ensuring that the funding, the unprecedented historic levels of funding, which have come into expanded learning through the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program and the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant in California. Um, the opportunities here are to support the community and districts in ensuring that they're optimized. Um, just to recap for people, this funding came to California in 21, 22, at a level of basically $124 billion. It's now in the new budget been raised to $4.8 billion. So it is really quite mind blowing how much additional funding is going to expanded learning. So the advocates in this space have all agreed that it's really the time to ensure that this is used for tangible changes and doesn't just float down and support existing budgets and that it also focuses on families most impacted by COVID and in underserved areas. So Tony Barrick and I are working on this. Tony, formerly of the commission who is now a volunteer and she actually led this project before she retired. Um, we have been working with Thrive Alliance, which is a group of nonprofits. It's, it's a group that organizes nonprofits in the nonprofit space. And we've been participating in their children and education um, Thrive Action Group. And in our last meeting, we were talking about the fact that we all need to get closer with the districts. And what Thrive is organizing is a meeting in the fall to bring in the districts, community-based organizations, and interested other parties like us 
to have these conversations and set in place some strategies and support kind of along the lines of starting to look towards building what Marin has going on with their Marin Promise Partnership that I talked to you guys about um, a, a while about, back. So when we were talking, we agreed that we should go talk to Marin. At the last Thrive Alliance meeting, we thought, let's do that. So Tony and I took it on ourselves to organize that meeting and we had Thrive Alliance, um, I'm just getting a notice that my computer's about to go to sleep. So I'm gonna plug that in. Uh, Thrive Alliance and key, key executives from the Marin Promise Partnership, which is about a, an organization that is about a hundred members, including the districts, County Office of Education, um, nonprofits, you know, community-based organizations, uh, libraries, you know, everybody is involved in working together to make sure um, expanded learning and issues in supporting schools, putting in place summer programs and such are dealt with optimally with a focus on the areas that need the most. And it's basically five districts they've identified in Marin that need the most. So all this to be said is that we made some great contacts and learned a lot of great information, which we're helping kind of, you know, our position in all of this in starting this research was with an eye to understanding what the issues are in San Mateo County and being part of kind of a bigger picture of supporting the districts in, in being able to do this work with CBOs. Um, where this leads to, I also sit on the, um, the, C, uh, the Child Care Partnership Committee, uh, sorry, the San Mateo Child Care Partnership Council, which meets once a month, and on Monday, Nancy McGee, Superintendent McGee, who sits on chairs the committee with Dave Pine, um, mentioned that what San Mateo has started to work on, and I think this is really interesting, is a cradle to career initiative. So um, they're in the information gathering phase of this too. When I think about cradle to career initiative, it was interesting because Marin Promise Partnership has all over their website, Cradle to Career um, Initiative, where they're looking at all of the programs and pillars that support kids from the time they're born, you know, through pre-K, through all of the supports needed in the first five and up through expanded learning, right to supporting them in um, going to, you know, further education and their career planning. Um, so this is super exciting because I think this, points to a real appetite in San Mateo for the same type of collaborative, nonprofit, um, profit, community-based partnership that, that has been very successful in Marin. And they've been, Marin has had this operating for 10 years already. So when COVID hit, they were up and running. They were able to kind of um, really maximize their community relationships and pivot very well. We had some examples of that in San Mateo County too. So anyway, that's um, some very exciting things happening in this space. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I realized my computer is going to die here. Okay, got it this time. Um, and we're part of it. Uh, so stay tuned, we're working on it. We're part of this discussion and uh, looking forward to that meeting in the fall. That's it for after school. And I think the next one, before, uh, you the, before just before you get to the next one, uh, did, did anyone have any questions oh, about sorry. after school advocacy uh, and the fund, the unprecedented funding that uh, Commissioner Huber Levy referred to? Commissioner Enriquez. Yeah, thank you so much um, for all this information. I'm very excited about this project too. Um, and I'm very looking forward to just see how uh, this, you know, the county and, and the districts and, you know, how our commission is planning to work together. Um, what you just mentioned right now reminds me of EM Path, Economic Mobility Pathways, um, kind of that shows like the bridge to economic mobility, but in a children's type of version educational so um, I know that you guys it's like it's really random but I'll just put the link in the chat maybe mm -hmm. thank you that's great thank you so much 
Yeah, and um, you know, I am glad about the funds. You know, there's a lot of money there, and um, I, I know that some districts uh, are not even using that money now, um, and they're using that money until like later next year, uh, just because you know staffing and burnout and all that stuff. Uh, which and the pandemic. Know, they yeah. all talk about there's so much planning going on that they're just swamped with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when I think about, um, you know, everything that we're doing um, and even the work that Redwood City Police Department is doing with the youth, I, I just feel that um, that the youth need to be be kept busy and they're not being kept busy. You know, we need like all these programs and, um, you know, I, I think that's, a missing huge piece there. Um, and I'm just very, ups, I guess, frustrated with there's so much funding, but where are the programs? I also see, you know, districts not wanting to collaborate with CBOs. You know, um, the, you know, I see a lot of CBOs advocating, you know, for their programs to help districts and districts are denying that. So I just, you know, I'm very excited about this and I want to see, you know, what's new. So um, yeah. I think, it, you know, having the opportunity to to learn from other, um, you know, counties in our region and to learn from best practices. And, you know, Marin were very forthright with us that it's not easy, but they, they've had some real shining examples of how when a district and all of the resources in a district that, and the, the example they used was one of their districts that basically had nothing. It's not that they were starting with a great structure and they built on it. They had very little and they decided, you know, this is our chance, let's all pull together. And the key component in that was having people in the community speak up and say, this is what we need, this is what we want and have the district leadership say, okay, yeah, let's 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 yeah. try this. Let's work together. And they, but the one caveat that um, the Marin people told us is that this didn't this just didn't just arrive out of nowhere. It was an area where they had a deep bench of trust and relationship, and so the people in the room really could work well together. And how important relationships were. That was one of the takeaways from the meeting. That building the relationships and having open communication is really key. So I'm I'm really looking forward to this type of kind of um, more intensive interaction at different levels in our community because maybe that'll start to break down some of the barriers and some of the sharing of information will encourage people to try new things, take a few risks, and also to have some optimization across the districts in terms of these relationships, because there's a lot of CBOs who are doing the same thing in different areas. And there could be some kind of gains in being able to provide things across the board. But anyway, lots of great ideas and we should definitely keep talking about it. Yep, thank you, Karine. You're welcome. Uh, if there are any questions from the public about, about after school advocacy, uh, please jump in. Um, that is my way of inviting public comment. Um, but since we have about 15 minutes left on the scheduled time, I would say, uh, Commissioner Huber Levy, uh, keep going. Okay. Next up. Yeah. So, um, we have a project to start to liaise with other JJDPCs, JJCs in our region and in the state. And a great opportunity popped up to do this um, with uh, Sonoma JJC, who contacted our JJDPC and asked us if we were interested in participating in a statewide initiative, starting with a call to discuss continuum, continuum, the continuum of care reform under AB 403 and the specific impacts in different counties. So that call took place today. and. Um, New Commissioner Wesley Liu and I were on that call representing the San Mateo County JJDPC. And I think both of us were really um, very impressed with the knowledge in the room. There were 30 participants, um, six, eight, 10 counties represented and a lot of expertise and uh, historical knowledge of the issues. Um, overall, what was agreed 
uh, and we had we met for about an hour and a half and had two breakout sessions to with you know four in each room to come up with two things a focus on key issues and a committee going forward to um, discuss how to uh, you, how to respond to key issues and, and how best to mobilize. And where we ended up is to agree to provide a level of education to everyone who was interested. Other, other counties too will be invited, um, but so that we're all speaking the same language so that we all have the same kind of understanding historically of what happened. Because the point that was really made to us was that if you're just arriving now to the continuum of care situation in your county, you're not understanding where you were and where the potential issues are. So you need to understand how this all evolved and then you know, understand how it impacts your specific county because counties are very, very different. And- um, Karen, could, so you we had just, a could you, sorry, could I pause just to ask you to quickly define what is continuum of care and what does the legislation address? I, you know, I'm really, I can't do that very well right now, but I'd be happy to do that for the next meeting because I feel like I've just gotten a very um, kind of quick education. But Susan can, yes. Susan can, That's yes. an expert. Basically, the idea was that they did not want youth in um, group homes anymore. Mm. And so they just decided they were going to do away with group homes and in their place, you would have STRTPs, short-term um, treatment facilities, residential, yeah. residential treatment facilities. And yeah. so, uh, the requirements for those STRTPs were really quite rigid, and as a result, many small group homes, and the ones that we had here in San Mateo County, uh, they went out of business. They because you, ha you had to have a psychologist on staff, I think was one thing. There were any number of requirements that so, uh, a, a group home that only took care of six to eight young people uh, simply could not have that, could not make that kind of investment. There were attempts for some of the group homes to go together on it to try and meet the requirements. In the end, only what was our receiving home and Canyon Oaks went through the process of becoming STRTPs. Now, the idea there was a child shouldn't be there, I think, for more than 90 days. I think Jayhan or, or um, uh, Melanie would know. Um, but you could only have them for there for a short period of time. And it, you, you can't um, deal with a child's severe mental problems in a very short period of time. So there was a, a they did allow for um, renewing the ability for a child to stay in an STRTP, but it, you have to jump through hoops to do it. So, okay, got it. The, so result, the, the result has been, there have never been enough foster homes to put each child in a foster home. And, right. and saying that they have to go into foster homes doesn't make the foster homes available. So now we end up sending children, or we sent out children out of state, or we're not doing that now, but out of county and out of the Bay Area for placements. Um, and the, re the reason it all came, got to such a state is because there were group homes that had 40, 80 children in them, and they were basically orphanages and there were all kinds of problems going on with them. Joanna can attest to that. She experienced one of the worst ones. Um, and so they, they did get a, rid of, but they, they threw out the baby with the bathwater. Right. Because there were small home-like group homes that should have been, uh, in my opinion, allowed to continue. Uh, and they needed to get rid of these orphanages where, where children were running rampant and they were being abused and all kinds of awful things were happening. I still have the articles that, that um, tell about that, but that, that's it. In that's a great overview that connects a lot of dots and to yeah. other things that we've had on the agenda as well. Um, and so, and so the, there is a group of people from other commissions uh, in other counties that are working on the kind of follow-up to that to try to improve the reform that was done. 
Well, so like Sonoma has been on top of it from the get go. Yeah, they're very they're very impressive that group. Yeah. So and the next steps great. are yeah the next steps are to um, plan out uh, kind of the education training to make sure that uh, everyone is up to speed on kind of the current situation, the history, you know, get the terminology, understand the issues, understand the potential opportunities of working together on this, um, and then, you know, bring that back to our individual commissions. And both Wesley and I have signed up to be on that committee. So we will continue to work with uh, that group. In the next few weeks, there will be another call. And the a really exciting thing about this is there was already a lot of energy in the room for, hey, can we also talk about this issue? Hey, can we also have a call about this? So I think that this is kind of going to be a great vehicle for us to have this liaison with the other commissions um, right. in our in our region to start with and, and to get, you know, kind of around the state to get contact. So it's, uh, it's ready-made. We just rolled into it. So there's perfect timing. Too bad Paul's not here to see this. I think this was his suggestion, but we'll catch him up on that. Any other questions on that one? No, thank you. Uh, I think that rolls nicely into uh, a legislative update. Yeah, so legislative update. Um, Johanna, last time, uh, Commissioner Rasmussen had some questions about, uh, you know, just to co communicating with the rest of the commission on resources for if the people want to understand where any piece of legislation is. And Johanna, you suggested having something on the Google Drive that could be accessible to everyone. So I updated my kind of very rudimentary summary when I first started on the commission and was asked to do this position um, about what I you know, kind of thought the role would be. So now that I have a lot more knowledge and experience in the last year, I updated that and provided links. So that is in the Google Drive um, under legislative coordinator liaison role. So for commissioners who are interested in, you know, who our contacts are and what websites to look at and how to get any update on current legislation, that's there. And I also just wanted to um, provide you with a brief introduction on a piece of legislation that's of interest. Um, let me just find it. It is, it's, it's very pertinent to the school to prison pipeline, which is why I'm raising it with you. It's SB 1273, and it pertains to school reporting on law enforcement. Um, and uh, through Kate Heaster, I was able to get in contact with the public council organization who are um, advocating for this piece of legislation. They're in LA and, um, the legislation is important because it's trying to recategorize some student behavior that that has been dealt with as uh, criminal. Um, so assault, minor possession of cannabis or alcohol, um, being uh, willfully disturbing a school meeting. Right now, there's a requirement that teachers have to inform law enforcement, and this bill is seeking to pull that back so that um, kind of limiting the, the theory behind that is that even minimal contact with juvenile criminal systems creates long term harm to individuals and once students have contact with the systems. They're less likely they're missing school time they're less likely to graduate there's kind of the butterfly effect, so um, I will send around some further information on this, it is it has uh, moved through. Um, to assembly, it has gotten through the Senate, three readings, it is in assembly and it is now in the Public Safety and Education Committee. And our contact at Public Council are advocating for it and we'll you know, keep informed on this. Um, so there's a lot of support. contact at Public Council, what do you, who's? Who? Public Council is an organization I just learned about through Kate, she, um, uh. Uh, at FLY, they, they advocate for many, and the, the people that are working on this one are, it's a, it's a very large organization. I've just learned about it. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, there's a specific group that deals with education and, and children's issues, and they're advocating on this. And so they're advocating to- Oh, sorry. When you say it's gotten through the Senate with three readings, does that mean there's been a committee and a vote in a committee, or is it just- Yeah. 
No, it's been approved through the three, each of the three Levels. readings. In. Okay, so it's, yeah. been, it's been, been- Well, really it goes through the Senate, the Senate bill, so it's gone through Senate, and now it has to kind of go through the whole assembly process. Assembly. Gotcha, okay. And, you know, potentially will become law this fall or not. Because there's, you know, there's conversations on both sides. And especially, I think there's a lot of um, anxiety over issues in schools. And so that will, you know, obviously have to be balanced. But right. the focus on this is not to deter or to take away the requirement to contact law enforcement for dangerous behavior, but it's to take away. I think the, the one that's seemed to be most unreasonably vague is a provision that has students being arrested for offenses as simple as knocking on classroom doors when class is in session, being prosecuted for willful disturbance of public schools or public school meetings. And I guess that has been um, traditionally been used against some the population of students that has felt to be, yeah, overreach. So that's my little update for you. Thank you. This week. Um, that um, is great information. And um, Johanna, I see your hand up. Give me one minute. Uh, we have we have four or five minutes left. And uh, as usual, we're chock full of information and uh, project updates, and we haven't gotten to talking about any new projects. Uh, maybe that's a sign that we don't have uh, time for <laughs> new projects. Uh, and that's okay because we're doing uh, we're doing a lot. Um, but uh, I was going to say that if there are commissioners who um, would like to get more involved in projects, um, you have not spoken tonight to you know update one that you're leading or um, or you feel you have more time. If we run out of time tonight to talk about those new projects, um, do reach out to me because um, as I'm forming the agenda for our next month's meeting, uh, we, can, we can decide just amongst ourselves to add something to the agenda and talk about it and talk about you know, staffing it and getting it started uh, for the commission. So would, I think you be, would, would you be open for some commissioners to stay on after the meeting and do a huddle with you? Uh, well, I'm also seeing that um, Commissioner Enriquez is asking if we can extend the meeting and I see Commissioner Rasmussen's hand up and maybe she wants to say something similar. So um, so if if there's a majority of commissioners that want to extend the meeting and continue discussing, we could do that. Uh, uh, Commissioner Rasmussen, was that why your hand was up? That, that wasn't why it was up, but I absolutely would be uh, in support of extending the meeting. Okay. Um, what, what, uh, what did you want to uh, say. It was a request for Commissioner uh, Huber Levy, if you could possibly report back on next month on AB 2361, the assembly bill that has to do with um, juvenile transfers to adult court, please. Hmm. Okay. Um, I was saying, I was muted, but yes, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I move we extend the meeting by 15 minutes. I second. Any further discussion on that? Okay, let's do a quick round the horn um, uh, to vote on that. Uh, I will start by saying uh, I, I will stay on for an extra 15 minutes. Commissioner Rasmussen. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Yes. Commissioner Swope. Yes. Commissioner Huber Levy. Yes. Commissioner Enriquez. Yes. Commissioner Nori. Yes. Commissioner Newton. I am unable to stay. That's all right. I think we will still have a quorum. Commissioner Liu. Yes. You're a commissioner now. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Aurora. Yes. I miss. Did I miss anyone? I don't yeah. think so. And I think we got a majority, and also we would still have a quorum. So, any partners uh, who weren't expecting to stay beyond seven fifteen, or members of the public, you of course are welcome to go at any time. Uh, but we, the commissioners, will stay uh, 
and continue the meeting for another 15 minutes. Just in time. It's we're awesome. right now because we're all excited and happy to be here. This has been a, a productive meeting and um, there sounds like there's a majority that want to keep being productive. Uh, so bye-bye. Thanks for coming. Okay, but we are uh, officially still um, holding our meeting. Uh, this is not a post-meeting huddle. We, uh, we have a quorum. Uh, and um, on the agenda, there was a, uh, an item for giving a quick update on, I think, marketing and social media. But uh, Commissioner Rasmussen, would you like, to, or commissioners, would you like to hear that update? Or do we want to get to the uh, discussion about projects? Open to open. To I discussion. don't think I don't think this item will take much time, and we can still have time to get on. Sounds to good. Project. Sounds good. Commissioner Rasmussen, go I'll ahead. Be, I'll be very brief. Our social media programs continue to expand. They're growing every month. We get new new followers, new mentions, new profile views. I want to remind everyone that our uh, meetings do go up on YouTube. I place them up on YouTube within forty eight hours of our meeting. So please, th there's an opportunity for folks there to watch it there as well. And I wanna give the last and uh, final call out for our website uh, uh, fiasco. Uh, it, we are at the end and we are going to now redesign. So it, I believe uh, we have everything that we need uh, to, that, to recreate it. Now we're going to redesign it. So please take a look at it. Please send me your feedback on it because we, I, I work with a team of people uh, from afar, which makes it very difficult. So to have all the feedback in place when, when we embark on this is very, very helpful. And then once this, this is all complete, I'm looking uh, forward to handing it over. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, just a comment that, that um, I do, the website does still, does now have links to, you know, a bunch of relevant things. It may not have everything, uh, but compared to where it was when they first, you know, did the redesign, uh, thank you for, for helping lead the charge to get more, more items linked to there. For example, the dashboard that I had uh, uh, put in the chat earlier in the meeting. So um, keep us posted. And, um, and, and I think Johanna earlier in the meeting mentioned that there are two social media platforms uh, and I think you meant Twitter and Instagram, right? Correct, did I misspeak? No, no, you just, I think you just didn't mention it. And so, and so just for everyone's information, those are the two and then the meetings on YouTube. So thank you for all that work. You're very welcome. Okay, uh, that gets us to our final agenda item, right? Does it not? Ah, no. Okay. The quick update on the commission retreat from me is that um, it, the date is set for August 20th. We all filled in our doodle poll for that. Uh, and I, I'm, I know I sent out an email notice to, to notify everyone, um, but we will be having a Saturday offsite uh, meeting uh, in August, August 20th. The other update is that, uh, and, and just a reminder, sort of the purpose of that is to be able to have a little bit more time uh, to meet in person, uh, to talk up, to get to know each other better, um, but also to kind of talk about uh, bigger picture, um, you know, how we get things done. Uh, uh, so anyway, more to come on that, uh, but that's high level. I think what we said we wanted to accomplish. And um, the county is gonna provide a facilitator for us, someone who, who works with organizations at events like this to, you know, uh, to talk about how organizations can work well together. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And um, I just heard a couple of weeks ago from, uh, from the county, from Connie Juarez de Ball, Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, who who also led the you know boards and commissions training uh, that happened a few months ago. I had reached out to her and uh, and she was excited about us you know scheduling an offsite and suggested a facilitator and I took her up on that and we have one. 
So that's exciting. You know who that is? You know what? I have the name uh, in an e deep in an email somewhere, but I will send it on to you. I also looked at her LinkedIn profile. Uh, she looks great. So I will uh, I will email that out. Okay. I, I was really recommending that we do an hour, an hour and a half in circle and privately just to get to know each other and then open it up to talk about um, commission business and open it up to the public at that point. But I, I asked Paul if he'd work with me to, to put up a straw man for, for um, some work in circle. And yeah. I think it would be, since we're proposing restorative practices for everybody else, I think we ought to sort of get into the experience of it ourselves. I think that's a great idea. Okay. I think that's a great idea too. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and I have not yet talked to the facilitator because I think, it, you know, she was on vacation, I was on vacation, but we should all be in town now. And, um, and, and so I should be talking to her soon. And, uh, and that'll just, that's just an introductory meeting. And then we, we can talk further about, you know, what our agenda is, uh, meaning we, the, the commission and commissioners. Do you know if, if she was uh, came through PCRC? I don't think she did. Oh. Yeah, more to come on that. Okay, but that's that's my quick update. So we uh, now getting to the last uh, agenda item discussion on proposed and draft projects. So there are there are other projects that align with our new aspirations that we voted on at the beginning of the year. Um, that one pager of you know proposed or suggested projects and the sort of um, alignment with, with aspirations is the last page in the agenda packet. Uh, and um, I mean, I really think that my suggestion here would be that, like I said uh, 10 minutes ago, we, we do have a lot going on already, um, but there are also some worthy things here that if there are commissioners who want to volunteer and get involved, um, um, they should. Uh, so I guess I'll just open it up to discussion. Are there particular projects that people want to work on or feel really should be worked on? Um, you, know, might, you might want to deprioritize something else. Um, let's open it up. Wesley. I'd like to work on the outreach to other JJDPCs and also outreach to elected officials, as well as the advocate for new or more diversion programs. Okay, I think, I think other than the outreach to elected officials, which was going um, steadily last year, um, those other ones are, are kind of already underway, right? So um, definitely continue those. Um, anyone else? Well, I had agreed to um, work on the outreach to elected and other county officials. So um, it'd be great if, if Welsley wants to join in on that. And I think Paul wants to continue. So if Roxanne is interested. I think the I think, I think the key from my experience of having worked on that is just to kind of have a steady drumbeat of weekly emails out to elected officials asking for Zoom meetings. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I did and, and um, that's what I would recommend. So someone on the, on the team just has to have that email template and reminder to send a couple out every week. Yeah, and, and I don't think we have to have the same people go. So if there are four of us on the committee, we can set them up when it works and, and just go out in teams of two. Yep. Is how okay. I, yeah, I'm doing so Susan, that. you you're continuing to work on that with the with those commissioners. That, if they're willing, I'm willing. <laughs> yeah. Um. Thanks. Um. So I, I I think I you know I'm used to talking to a lot of elected officials um, just because I have all, all these relationships. Um. But um, I'm just wondering, like, what what I guess I just need a refresher on what is the main goal we're trying to accomplish 
by reaching out to our elected officials is to is it to tell them about our work plan or like i guess what is the point so, so they know so they know what we're doing yeah. and they they can uh, support our efforts within their purview mm -hmm. it, it, it 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 for when i was doing it it was really just information exchange essentially uh you know let them know some of the projects that we're working on um, and have an opportunity to ask them what are they, you know, what in this area do they really care about and what do they want us to, to, to work on? And that just gets the conversation going where then, you know, ideas and information gets exchanged and a relationship gets built. So it's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I want to sign up for that one and also the one with uh, Kareen with the after school stuff. I'm very interested in education. So I, I, I want to do that one. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. One of the areas that, that uh, a, you know, a new aspiration that we carved out uh, when we redid our aspirations at the beginning of the year was um, re-entry uh, and transition. Uh, so um, there are a couple ideas there that uh, they're certainly worthwhile to look into. Um, but we also need, you know, we, we have a lot of good things going, so it doesn't necessarily have to be now. And, uh, but if there are commissioners who feel like they have some more time to devote to a project, then they can, uh, then I would, I would encourage you to look into that area. Johanna? But I propose that maybe we bring this back in the fall, maybe in November to look at this again when the peer projects kind of, peer point projects sort of wrapping up. And then, because there are some very valuable things that, I mean, all of the things here are important. And so maybe when we have a little bit more bandwidth, it's not that far away, maybe we can bring this back. We can continue with what we've expressed interest in and then look more in depth at that time. Would that be... Um, that'd be something that we might want to consider doing. I mean, I, I think that's a good suggestion, especially because we also have inspections uh, mm -hmm. to work on. So um, how about this? I guess the only thing too with the inspections is if we are looking at a project that somehow information could be gained through the inspections, you know, I'm just thinking of the suggestion of following up and tracking the kids in youth services in terms of their education credits and the re-entry into. I guess I would suggest that that's a good reason to table for now any new projects, right? And focus on the inspections and maybe use that as a launching off point to look into new things mm -hmm. going in. I'm just saying you like have that in your mind when you're doing the, the youth services and the education part of it. Just yeah, we can certainly have the lens, right, and the, the lens of the new aspirations that we have, like as we're doing the inspections. Mm -hmm. So how about this? I would, in the, we have two minutes left. I would like to make a motion that we table any new projects for now. And I don't, I won't need to add this to the agenda for our next meeting, that we keep going on uh, the very worthwhile projects that we have going. And, uh, and also, you know, make sure that we have time to devote to um to inspections table, the table usually means it comes up at the next meeting i think you want oh. to post, you want to postpone it thank you yes till december as or edited november. yes as amended there that is my motion i'll second that monroe thank you monroe, Any, i had a question yes wesley oh will the elected officials outreach still happen because i think it's important because of midterms that's, that's an on, that's one that's already already been formed so it will continue Any other comments or questions about that? So should we just clarify when we, and we don't have to do that at this meeting, but maybe you and I, Monroe, can just go through that list and just clarify which ones are being postponed, just so we know, and then we can attach that to the minutes. Yeah, yeah, uh, let's do that. Uh, all right, to end the meeting, I, would call for a voice vote on this motion. And to be more specific, let's postpone until October. 
<clears throat> All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone want to do more work? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, good. The motion passes. Uh, discussion of new projects will be on hold until October. And uh, for the minutes, Karen and I will clarify exactly which projects we were talking about. And, um, and then when the minutes come up for approval at our next meeting, if, you, if there are any questions, we can talk about it then. Sounds thank good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone you. who stayed on. Thank you, Judge Atazadi. You've had yeah, a long time. Thank you, Judge Atazadi. Uh, it's uh, my bye pleasure. Bye. Thank you. I, I have to just say, I think the commission is doing a fabulous job. So many interested people, and I'm just very impressed. So We're getting, getting stuff it. done too. Thank you, Judge. Sure are. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. Nice to hear that. It's true. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.